Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security disability exams. And today I'm going to discuss a topic that I believe has never been presented in the medical literature before. As usual, everything I say represents my opinions based on my experience and learning, and not that of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. And what I'm going to talk about is folie à deux in the setting of functional illness. So what is folie à deux? Well, in the French translation is psychosis of two. Folie à deux is an old psychiatric diagnosis which doesn't exist in the current DSM-5 which in my opinion is just another example of why the DSM is a dreadful humbug. Folia de occurs when two people have a very close relationship and tend to be isolated from other people. Usually one person, the more dominant person, has delusions and the other person, the more submissive person, comes to believe these delusions. It's also been known as shared delusional disorder. With functional illness, I see folia adu on a regular basis, and the delusions are non-bizarre and not associated with mood. In folia de associated with other psychotic illnesses, such as schizophrenia, the delusions may be bizarre. And in certain disorders, such as bipolar illness, they can be mood-dependent. But what's essential for the diagnosis is that both parties share a delusional belief. In functional illness, what I see is a hypochondriacal patient who believes they're severely ill or injured and incapacitated, and a caretaker who believes that they have to do everything for this poor, incapacitated partner. It's rather like the Oedipal complex as described by Freud, where a man fully grown, acts like a helpless infant, and his mother takes care of him as if he were helpless. The bargain between the two, which is never explicit, is that you do everything for me and I will never leave you. I've seen folia de where the helpless invalid is male, and I've seen it where the helpless invalid is female, and it seems to be pretty equally distributed. What are the indications that you're dealing with a folia de situation? Well, I believe the most important is that the caretaker wants to do all the speaking for the invalid. They will tell you things like the invalid has trouble thinking, or trouble with memory, when it appears to you that they have no difficulty whatsoever. Assessing the patient's mental function, their cognitive abilities, their memory, and their speech is approximately 50% of the information that Social Security wants from a disability exam. And you cannot evaluate those if the patient isn't allowed to speak. This presents a problem because when I ask the caretaker to allow the patient to speak, they often fly into a rage. I believe the reason is because I'm threatening the foundation of their diet, which is if the patient can speak for themselves, perhaps they can do other things for themselves and don't need the caretaker. I have found that I have to set firm boundaries. 
if the caretaker continues to interrupt and answer all questions, I explain to them that I'm required to evaluate the patient's mental functions and speech, and I cannot do that if the patient isn't allowed to answer my questions and engage in a dialogue with me. I do tell the caretaker that if it seems to me that the patient is having a problem with memory or thinking, I'll gladly accept their help, but they must remain silent while I'm talking with the patient otherwise. I've had to go so far as tell the caretaker that if they interrupt one more time, I'll end the examination and they'll have to find another physician. I haven't ever done so, but I feel that it's important that I mean what I say. The caretaker may also interfere in the physical exam, objecting to the things that I ask the patient to do, either on the basis that the patient can't do them or they'll be too painful. Again, you need firm boundaries. For example, I had a patient brought in by their caretaker and the patient was in a wheelchair. I was eventually able to get the patient out of the wheelchair to sit on the exam table, then had them stand up and walk, and they could walk perfectly normally. That's an example of how extreme this situation can be. Of course, I'm not involved in the treatment of such people, but from what I read, the most essential thing to do is to separate them and allow the invalid to gain some autonomy. Well, I hope that's been interesting. And as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.